Hi students, today we're going to be talking about visual justice. Before we do that, however, I want to review what we learned about last time. So, the last chapter we looked at was from uh, Rush Schaefer Landau's book, Living Ethics, and in particular we were looking at economic justice and economic equality. Now, there are various ways that we could distribute social goods, and in that chapter we talked about a few of those ways. And one of those ways that we've talked about in the past, right, but we didn't talk so much about this past chapter, was utilitarianism. Right? According to utilitarians, how should we distribute uh, social goods, like money? Um, and utilitarians think a just distribution is one that maximizes utility, that maximizes happiness. We're familiar with that view. A new view for us uh, was the liberal view. Right? Someone like Rawls thinks that a just distribution of social goods is one where any inequalities that exist must be to the benefit of those who are least well off. So if we're going to have inequality, it's got to be to the benefit of the people who are least well off. And then finally, according to libertarians like Nozick, a just distribution of social goods is one where each individual is entitled to his or her social goods by the principles of justice and acquisition, justice and transfer, and rectification of injustice. So that was what we talked about last time. Um, and all that stuff, in a way, is going to be relevant to our topic moving forward, right? So as we talk about race in America, as we talk about immigration policy, um, people like utilitarians, liberals, libertarians, they're all going to have views about how we should deal with problems uh, that exist in our society. All right. To start, I want to look at a quote from last chapter. Um, there, Schaefer Landau says, In 1983, the median household wealth of white families in the U.S. was eight times that of black families in the U.S. By 2013, that gap had grown. At that point, median white families owned 12 times the wealth, that is, $134,230 on average. Um, tw so median white families owned 12 times the wealth of median black families, which was $11,030. And wealth, remember, right, that's not income, annual income. Rather, wealth is sort of one's total assets. So you might own a house, you own some cars. If you basically sold everything you owned and paid off all your debts, how much money would you have? That's what wealth is. Now, the question is, how can we explain that? Why do white families own so much more than black families? And some, I imagine some, some um, ideas come to mind, right? Um, what Schaefer Landau is going to suggest in this chapter is that the reason that that gap is so wide is because of the legacy of racism in the United States. So let's talk about racism. What is it? Right? When we're talking about racism, what are we talking about? Schaefer Landau defines racism as the view that members of a given race are inferior by virtue of their racial identity. So when we talk about racism, we're talking about the view that some races are superior to others, and as a result, some races are inferior to others. And that inferiority is uh, attributable to racial identity itself. Now, if racism is, is just sort of this view, generally speaking, then when is an act racist? An act, according to Schaefer Landau, is racist if it expresses the view that members of a given race are inferior by virtue of their racial identity. So an act is going to be racist when it expresses the view uh, that racism uh, it, when it expresses a racist view. Now, what about people, right? So we often talk about acts as being racist. Well, when are people racists? And I think here there are two different sort of ideas we have in mind. I think maybe historically the most common uh, view, or maybe when we think about what it means for someone to be a racist, is to say that that person believes that members of a given race are inferior by virtue of their racial identity. So a race, we define racists in terms of what they believe. Um, 
But there's another way in which we could think about um, someone being racist, and that's when someone performs racist acts. So there's one definition of racist. On that definition, someone's racist when they believe a certain thing. Uh, on another definition, someone's racist when they perform racist acts. And I think it's important to keep those two definitions separate. So sometimes we accuse each other of being racist, and are we accusing each other of believing that members of a certain race are inferior or superior? And maybe that's pretty uncommon these days, right? I think most of us, I would hope all of us, right, thought that members of a given race uh, are, are on a par. But um, even if we sort of all believe that, it's possible that some people still perform racist acts, right? Acts that express a view uh, that's in conflict with what they explicitly believe. And so let's keep that distinction in mind going forward. All right, now let's talk about examples of racism at the governmental level, right? This chapter is about the legacy of racism. Where do we see racism show up in the past in the US? The most obvious example, right, is slavery and the slave trade. So in the past, uh, slavery was practiced commonly in uh, the US, and in particular, this kind of chattel slavery where you know, once you're a slave, you're always a slave, and your children are slaves too. Um, you have no rights, you're considered property, um, and your kids right, are, are property as well. Obviously, that's a problematic, uh, horrible institution that was abolished in, at the end of the Civil War, 1865. But that wasn't the end of racism at the governmental level, right? So after slavery was abolished, we still had Jim Crow laws, we still had segregation, rules that made it uh, separated the races, uh, separate but equal policies, right, where black children go to one school, white children go to another school, and those schools are supposedly separate but equal. Now, the problem, uh, among many, is that the schools weren't actually equal, right? So they were separate and unequal, uh, and that was a problem. And that, those sorts of policies were ruled unconstitutional um, over 50 years ago, right, 1954. But again, that's not the end of racist governmental policies. So we see redlining by the Federal Housing Administration. Um, what is redlining? That was a policy by which the Federal Housing Administration wouldn't give loans to people who were looking to buy uh, housing or buildings in areas uh, that had large black African-American populations. And so as a result, it was hard for black people to get loans. They couldn't buy houses. They couldn't buy businesses. Uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't sort of start to accumulate wealth. And that's going to have downstream effects, right? Um, and that might contribute to that number that we saw. Finally, Shafer Landau talks about the war on drugs, and specifically the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, um, which went into effect, I think, in the 80s, if I remember correctly. And what that did was it mandated stiffer punishments for the use of crack cocaine, which was more commonly used in the black community, than the use of powder cocaine, which was more commonly used by uh, white people. And the thought is, it's just sort of bizarre that this exact same substance, cocaine, right, is going to be pu punished more in this one form that's common uh, in black, the black community and punished less severely um, in this other form that's used more commonly by white people. Now, those are just examples of racism at the governmental level. But what about examples of racism at the individual level? Um, obviously, there are particular racist acts that people have performed uh, for long periods of time. But one that Rush Schaefer Landau uh, emphasizes and highlights is implicit bias. What implicit bias is, it's not an explicit belief uh, that one race is superior to another, um, but it's rather a bias in favor of certain races or people of certain races uh, over people uh, who are not uh, in that race. And in particular, right, we're thinking typically here about people who have a racist bias in favor of white people, um, the majority race, and a negative sort of implicit bias towards uh, minority races and especially uh, 
people who are black. Now, this sort of implicit bias leads to what is called white privilege. And white privilege um, was sort of first uh, discussed by Peggy McIntosh. She gave some examples of white privilege. Um, one example is this. So when white people turn on the television, they see white, white people widely represented. Um, so seeing people of your own race widely represented in popular culture, um, it's a kind of privilege, right? Now, what, ex what exactly does that privilege amount to? Um, we need to tease that out a little bit. But uh, it's one among many ways in which uh, there's this bias sort of in favor, and it leads us, I guess it leads us to have this implicit bias uh, in favor of certain groups. The, the dominant majority group over um, minority groups. Another example of white privilege is that when white people are told about their national heritage or about civilization in general, they're shown people of their own color. And we can see why these things are obviously problematic, right? Another, white people don't have to educate their children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. I mean, obviously that racism exists and results in uh, black people in particular and other minorities um, being uh, in physical danger is a bad thing. But there's also this fact, right, that white people don't have to warn their kids about that. this, that white kids don't have to worry about um, being harassed by the police or something like that. That's a privilege that you might not notice if you're white, um, but uh, you notice the harm, right, if you're not in the dominant racial group. Here's another one that I think is, is particularly interesting, right? When white people swear or dress in secondhand clothes or fail to answer letters, they don't have to worry that people will attribute these choices to the bad morals or the poverty or the illiteracy of their race. So white people are able to do all sorts of things that if a black person were to do that thing, they would be judged as um, being part of a race that had bad morals or, you know, a poor a race that's poor, or, uh, people who are illiterate. Right? So um, I, you know, I as a white, you know, heterosexual white man, don't face people worrying about, you know, if I swear, they don't think, oh, John's immoral. Uh, or if I dress in secondhand clothes, they don't think, oh, John's poor. Um, if I don't answer their letters, they don't think John's probably illiterate. Uh, they don't think any of those things, right? And that's a kind of privilege that I have as a result of being white. When white people are pulled over by the police, they can be sure that they haven't been singled out because of their race. I haven't been pulled over by the police very often, but when I have been, I haven't thought, you know what, that police officer probably pulled me over because I was white, right? I never had to even consider that as a possibility, um, but that's something that people, uh, racial minorities have to, have to think about, right, when they're pulled over or singled out by the police. Now, we've got, you know, significant problems here. There's obviously the problem of the, the wealth inequality. That's, you know, when we're talking about economic inequality, that sort of wealth inequality stands out. But we see that there's also these sorts of implicit bias, privilege, um, or the lack thereof that racial minorities are facing. And the question is, like, what does the government supposed to do about that? Um, what should it do? One thing that it could do, right, and something that's gained a bit of traction in, in popular culture is that the government could offer historically disadvantaged groups uh, reparations, that is some form of compensation to acknowledge its wrongdoing. So oftentimes when we think about reparations in the popular culture, we're thinking about financial compensation. Um, but it's important to note that reparations could take other forms as well. So the sort of popular idea um, in politics these days is that um, the U.S. government could give cash payments to black people, um, maybe if and only if those black people have, in, you know, some way of showing that they're the descendants of, of people who suffered from slavery, 
exactly how the policy would work, right, is controversial. But they're generally thinking about some sort of financial compensation. But reparations could take other forms, right? So, for example, one of the articles in our book is about reparations to Native Americans, and Corlett's suggestion in the book is that uh, the government's required to give back almost all of the United States land to the Native Americans who we unjustly took it from. Now that view might seem sort of bizarre uh, at first, but when you think about it more carefully, you might think, no, that actually seems appropriate. We should give back all of the land. I mean, if I take your land and I just keep it for a long time, it doesn't somehow become mine suddenly, right? I'm still required to give it back to you no matter how long I kept it. So um, land transfers would be one way to pay reparations. Another way would be affirmative action. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about that. Affirmative action, uh, as many of you know, is a social policy that increases a qualified applicant's chances of being admitted at school uh, or getting a job on the basis of their membership in a historically disadvantaged group. So the idea with affirmative action is that we're not just giving people jobs or giving people positions in schools even though they're unqualified. Rather, the thought is we make sure that this person is qualified first and then we give them some sort of uh, positive uh, mark or give, make them somehow more likely to get the job as a result of belonging to a historically disadvantaged group. And what we're going to focus on in this section is primarily a racial minorities, but you could think of um, women as being a historically disadvantaged group as well, and another group that might deserve affirmative action. Affirmative action involves, you know, there are various ways that we could think of affirmative action. One sort of a uh, basic way that almost everyone agrees is, is appropriate is that when you're um, hiring for a job, uh, you should post that job to uh, sites, to newspapers, in places that are accessible by everyone. So we're not allowed to sort of like hide the fact that we're, we're hiring someone and just ask all our buddies, right, we're supposed to post those positions. And that's not something that necessarily private, certain private companies have to do, but um, public companies, public universities, um, other federal jobs have to be posted publicly. Um, that's less controversial. Something more controversial right, is like a quota system. Um, and this was famously challenged uh, by Alan Bakke, who uh, wanted to get into, I think, the University of California, Davis, uh, is their medical school, and uh, or maybe it was Berkeley, I'm not sure. Anyway, the important thing is that that particular school held a certain number of spots, and they said, you know, we're going to hold these 16 spots for racial minorities. And Bakke thought that, that was unfair, and the Supreme Court agreed with him and said that that was unconstitutional. But since then, the Supreme Court has upheld affirmative action policies where membership in the historically disadvantaged group is just a plus factor among, among other plus factors. So for example, the University of Michigan uh, had an affirmative action policy um, that was upheld where they didn't, um, they didn't, they did give up sort of some benefit or they sort of considered race as a plus factor towards someone's admissions but it was considered uh, part of their holistic application. It wasn't just given a certain number of points or something along those lines. I think it's important to note that I suggested that affirmative action could be a kind of reparations, but as we'll see going forward, we don't have to think of affirmative action as uh, having as a goal uh, reparations, like being compensation for something unjust in the past. Rather, we could think of affirmative action purely in kinds of consequentialist terms, where it's not about the past injustice, but rather the affirmative action, the goal of it, is to bring about a more just social uh, situation. And so that leads us to the last slide, right? Here, I just want to prompt you to think about this. 
Given what we know about utilitarians, would they support reparations in general and affirmative action more specifically? What about political liberals? What about libertarians? Right? Especially if you're going to end up writing about this or discussing this, you want to think through these questions. How would utilitarians, political liberals, libertarians think about this? And even, right, you might think about, you know, what would someone who, who uh, endorses the principle of universalizability or the principle of humanity, what would they say about you know, these policies? All right, uh, that's it for this lecture. We'll see you again soon.